Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Prithpal Singh. And uh, we have had a new curriculum, the CBME curriculum that has come into, uh, that has been implemented in 2019. And accordingly, our uh, curriculum has been defined and designed and we have various competencies that we need to answer uh, and we, that those competencies need to be taught. So in pharmacology, I'll be talking about a competency today. Uh, one of the components of the competency is uh, the competency that I'll be talking about is the competency PH 1.34, which says that you should know the mechanism of action, the types, the side effects, the indications, the contraindications of the drugs that are used as antidiarrheal as well as the drugs that are used as laxatives. So I would be labeling them as drugs used for constipation and diarrhea. And we would be talking about these particular two category of drugs today. And I hope that uh, after this particular class, there is some amount of clarity on this particular aspect of constipation and diarrhea. And uh, maybe if there is any queries, after even preceding this particular class, I would be happy to answer if uh, you, you could always do that. You could always uh, give me a query in the chat box and I would definitely get back to you. So we start with this particular class of diarrhea and constipation, obviously with the aim that we need to understand the learning objective would be that we need to understand what are the drugs that are used. Obviously, before that, we also need to know what are the various factors and uh, uh, methods that we can adopt to take care of constipation and diarrhea. So first we talk about laxatives. Now laxatives are those drugs that help in evacuation of bowel. These drugs, they tend to promote the evacuation of bowel and depending upon the intensity of their action, they could be divided into either laxatives or purgatives. Laxative or apparents have a moderate intensity of action. Purgatives have a high intensity of action. So these particular drugs could be classified as drugs that could be either bulk forming drug, one of the because one of the factors that has been implicated in constipation is lack of dietary fibers. So bulk forming di uh, drugs uh, tend to add dietary fibers to the uh, the content, the intestinal content, where we can use bran, psyllium, or isafibar. Or we could use tool softeners such as docusates and liquid paraffin. We could go for stimulant purgatives, which could be diphenyl methane such as phenolphthalein or biscardil, biscodil, or we could use anthraquinone such as cena and casca. We could use 5-HT4 agonist, which is tegacerod. We could use fixed oils such as castor oil, or we could also go for osmotic purgatives, which are magnesium and sodium salts and lactobacillus. Now, the mechanism of action of all these drugs is they could either, uh, the main purpose is that you have to in, increase the water content of stool. So they could have a hydrophilic or osmotic action. They could be acting on the intestinal mucosa. They could increase the propulsive activity and this propulsive activity could be due to either of these pathways. It could inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase, it could stimulate the adenylcyclase, it could enhance the prostaglandin synthesis and it could also lead to structural injuries. The first category of drug is the bulk uh, purgatives which I talked about. First we talk about dietary fibers. One of them that is commonly used is bran which is an unabsorbable cell wall and other constituents. And what they do is they tend to increase the water content of the stool. So what they do is they soften and facilitate the exit. But there are certain fibers, uh, these certain fibers, they tend to bind with bile acids and they could lead to problems. Now these particular dietary fibers are used for simple constipation. Uh, they could be used for irritable bowel syndrome or they could be used for colonic diverticulosis. There are a lot of disadvantages that we, uh, that are there associated with these dietary fibers such as bran and that is the first one of them is that a large quantity of it is take, to be taken. It is unpalatable, 
it has a delayed onset and it is not there for people who are already constipated it could lead to gut ulceration adhesion stenosis or fecal impaction whereas when we talk about the other drug esophagol which is a colloidal mucilage forming gelatinous mass but this can always cause esophageal impaction then we have stool softeners such as docuswates which is dioctyl sodium sulfosuccinate or dos this is as an ionic detergent which leads to net water accumulation it emulsifies the colonic content and increases penetration so that means the water penetrates in this uh, stool and it is only useful when the straining in stool is not required because it could lead to cramps abdominal pain nausea and hepatotoxicity then we have liquid paraffin that is another drug that is used this is bland it can always lead to foreign body granuloma there are chances that it could lead to lipid pneumonia it could cause deficiency of fat soluble vitamins and one of the major factors is that it could cause leakage this is a type of embarrassment to the patient and it could also interfere with healing now stimulant purgatives are used for excessive purgation they could lead to a fluid and electrolyte imbalance they could cause hypokalemia they could cause colonic atony they could reflexively stimulate gravid uterus and they could also lead to intestinal obstruction so we have the first drug in this group is biscodil which is activated in the intestine and acts on colon it irritates the mucosa and produces mild inflammation and secretion whereby there is fluid evacuation cramps and allergic reaction we have anthraquinones which are unabsorbed and pass to the colon where they are activated by the bacteria and absorbed to act locally then we have castor oil which is hydrolyzed to lipase to ricinoleic acid and glycerol these are unpalatable though they have a disadvantage that they are unpalatable they require frequent cramping violent action is required and it could lead to after constipation one of the drug that has shown some promise is stegaserod which is a selective 5 ht4 partial agonist it activates the p junctional receptor thereby enhancing the release of acetylcholine and calcitonin gene related peptide thereby incre uh, increasing peristaltic reflex and colonic secretion they are mainly used for irritable bowel syndrome and chronic constipation it has certain side effects that it can lead to loose motions because obviously because it increases peristalsis it could lead to headaches and fatigue then we have osmotic laxatives that are frequently used we have lactulose which is most commonly used it is a semi synthetic derivative of lactose and fructose which is neither absorbed nor active nor digested and the advantage is that it is activated in colon by the bacteria although it can lead to flatulence cramp and nausea now this particular drug is mainly used for hepatic encephalopathy because uh it tends to increase the will take care of relief because less ammonia would then be absorbed and would the chances of hepatic encephalopathy would decrease but there are certain contraindications to these drugs that are used as laxative it should not be used in undiagnosed abdominal pain colic or vomiting as well as organic constipation so any case where you have uh, a slight uh, doubt about intestinal obstruction these drugs are contraindicated these all these drugs could be used for functional constipation which could be either spastic or atonic it could be used in bed ridden patients it could be used to avoid it could be used to avoid straining on stool it could be used for preparation before surgery and even even when certain anti helminthics are given and even in cases of food and drug poisoning now coming to the other aspect that is there apart from constipation is diarrhea where there is excessive loss of water uh, leading to fluid and electrolyte imbalance so out here the principle of management of diarrhea include that we should go for treatment of fluid depletion take care of shock and acidosis as well as there is maintenance of nutrition and then drug therapy so drug therapy out here occupies the last space the first management protocol for this is treatment of fluid depletion shock and acidosis and then maintenance of nutrition 
so for for diarrhea we tend to use rehydration or this could depend whether you want to go for a uh, intravenous fluid or oral intravenous fluid is generally used when the fluid loss is more than 10% of the body weight where patient comes with acidosis and shock he may, he might have manifestations of weakness stupor and vomiting one of the components that is given is the dhaka fluid which contains 85 millimoles of sodium chloride 13 millimoles of potassium chloride 48 millimoles of sodium bicarbonate uh, so as to give uh, 133 millimoles of sodium 13 millimoles of potassium 98 millimoles of chloride and 48 millimoles of bicarbonate for situations where the fluid loss is less than 10% we could go for oral and it could be either you could use isotonic or hypotonic molar concentration molar ratio of glucose equal to that of sodium that is 110 milliosmoles potassium and citrate bicarbonate to make up the loss so the components out here is we tend to give sodium 90 millimoles potassium 20 millimoles chloride 80 millimoles citrate 10 millimoles and glucose obviously 9 90 millimoles, which is equivalent to sodium. For drug therapy, we could go for specific antimicrobial drugs or non-specific antiviral drugs. Obviously, for that we need to have, uh, we need to look into all the differential diagnoses that are there. Now, the specific antimicrobial therapy could be uh, we need to because as such, antimicrobial therapies are of no value if we have a non-infective diarrhea. which could be due to the inflammatory bowel syndrome it could be due to celiac disease and a situation where there is pancreatic enzyme deficiency tropical disease or thyrotoxicosis and even in cases of uh, viral diarrhea where antimicrobials would be of minimal help antimicrobials are only useful whenever there is a severe diarrhea such as uh, travelers diarrhea enteropathogenic e coli shigella salmonella typhimurium or yersinia enterocolitica uh, where in if any situation where this particular type of uh, bacteria is implicated as a causative agent obviously antimicrobial would be of help but antimicrobial would be definitely helpful in cases of cholera caused by vibrio cholera campylobacter jejuni clostridium difficile amebiasis and giardias uh the antimicrobials that can be used we can talk obviously we'll have it in a, another a separate section of antimicrobial agents but uh, we talk about non specific non secretory agents or non specific agents that are used for no uh, non infective diarrhea out of these the first agents that are used is uh, anti secretory agent the one of first of them is sulfasalazine so we tend to use 5 amino salicylic acid for inflammatory bowel disorder which uh, because this is poorly absorbed absorbed in intestine the bacteria stress this azo bond and they, therefore this 5 amino salicylic acid exerts a local anti inflammatory effect this is normally used during exacerbation it reduces frequency cramps and fever though it has certain adverse effects associated with it because this is of obviously a sulfur comp containing compound so it can lead to rashes fever joint pain hemolysis blood dyskinesis and oligosuspermia another derivative sulfur uh, sulfasalazine derivative is mesalazine which is a delayed preparation coated with acrylic polymer and this is done so that it delivers to the distal small bowel and colon so this is absorbed and metabolized in the liver there are certain adverse effects associated with these drugs such as nausea diarrhea abdominal pain headache rashes and hypersensitivity we could use 5 amino salicylic acid enemas or alsalazine which is used for this particular category of drug there are certain other drugs that can be used for inflammatory bowel disorder such as corticosteroids if the case is severe enough or we could also use immunosuppressants again this is the situation is the inflammatory bowel disorder where we could use these immunosuppressants as such as azathioprine methotrexate cyclosporine and infliximab <laughs> another drug that can be used is resicardotril which is converted to thiophenes and prevents degradation of endogenous encephalins and it decreases intestinal hypersecretion it has certain adverse effects associated with this drug that is nausea vomiting diarrhea and dizziness then we have anti motility drugs these are drugs that tend to reduce the peristalsis or movement of small uh, they tend to decrease the small bowel movement thereby delaying diarrhea so we have these drugs they increase the tone of the small bowel and it also increase the segmenting activity thereby reducing the propulsive movement and diminishing intestinal secretion
These drugs generally tend to act on new receptor and one of these drugs is codeine or opioid derivative and all of us know that opioid derivative has a constipating action. And this constipating action is mainly uh, because of its peripheral action of this new receptor on the small intestine and colon. So to take care of this, we have a synthetic derivative of opioid and that is loperamide, which is a peripheral new acting and weak anticholinergic property. Obviously, we would like to have an opioid derivative, which has only peripheral uh, mu action so as to avoid any addictive potential. The entry to brain is negligible. That means addictive potential is minimized and duration of action is longer. What it does, it tends to inhibit the secretion by interacting with calmodulin and enhancing the anal spinster stone. There are certain adverse effects associated with this particular drug, such as abdominal cramps and rashes, paralytic alias, toxic megacolon, and abdominal distension. Now, the, where can we use this particular drug? This particular drug could be used in, used in case of non-infective diarrhea, mild traveler diarrhea, and idiopathic diarrhea. So this is all regarding the drugs that are used as laxatives and as uh, anti-diarrheal drugs. So for laxative, obviously, we need to increase the roughage content. That is a non-pharmacological measure that would help us. And whenever we are talking about treatment of diarrhea, our prime, or prime and sole aim is to take care of dehydration. And this would depend, obviously, upon the amount of fluid loss from the body. If the fluid loss is more than 10%, we go for parenteral preparation of IV fluids and if it is less than 10%, we could go for oral rehydration salts containing sodium, potassium, citrate, carbonate and glucose. So this is all regarding the drugs that could be used for diarrhea as well as, as laxatives. And I hope I have been able to clear some doubt and some air on this particular topic. And if there are any queries pertaining to this topic, you could get back to me. I would be happy, very happy to answer them. Thank you so much for your patient listening and have a good day.